Welcome to our course in church history. I'm Dr. James Miller. In this course, we'll do a sweeping exploration of the last 2,000 years, looking at how the church interacted with the cultures and nations around it. We'll see how the story of Jesus grew from a small rural population in the Middle East to a global phenomenon welcoming billions of followers today. We'll discuss the early foundations of theology, mission, and martyrdom that laid the foundation for the church in the first five centuries, culminating in the life of Augustine of Hippo. It might be a surprise to some, but we'll discover that the church laid the foundation for the arts and the sciences that exploded out of the Middle Ages. We'll then follow the reformers through a season of upheaval and war that changed the face of Europe. Christianity was a significant voice in the shift to modernity, and we'll see that it remained a countercultural voice in the 20th century through the development of post-modernity, answering a bleak and mechanistic worldview with a promise of hope and love. Church history is the story of God's ongoing interactions with his human creation, a fascinating, passionate, and sometimes embarrassing look at the people of faith. I'm Dr. James Miller. Welcome to Church History. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, we basically have no money for these videos. John Locke's letter on toleration, published in 1689, was one of the most important intellectual contributions to the discussions about the relationship of church and state. In it, Locke makes a passionate case for preserving the right of religious people to think and practice as they wish to within the appropriate boundaries of a commonwealth. In this video, I want to name significant political, religious, and philosophical influences that shaped Locke's work, and then give a brief summary of the outline of the paper. But most importantly, I want to encourage you to read the letter yourself. It's less than 50 pages long, and it's not a difficult read. Always go to the primary sources first before you watch videos or read secondary literature about it. The original sources are great for a reason. And it's worth starting with them before you listen to someone else's interpretation of them. John Locke lived from 1632 to 1704, and he made major contributions to epistemology, politics, education, and religious tolerance. Remember, in this era of world history, there was not the division of academic categories that we experience today in which one is either a scientist or an artist or a religious figure. In the generations prior to the Enlightenment, if one was an intellect, one's intellect was unbounded in its fields of interest. A priest could produce works of science, an artist could design technological innovations that wouldn't be developed for centuries. There was no limits to the categories within which one could explore intellectual curiosities. It's important before reading the letter concerning toleration to look at the influences that would have shaped the mind of Locke, that would have shaped his interests and his fears. Locke was born during the Thirty Years' War, which spanned from 1618 to 1648, finally ending in the Peace of Westphalia when Locke was about 16 years old. The war left four to eight million dead and killed about a third of the German population. The Thirty Years' War is generally thought to be a manifestation of the conflicts that arose after the Protestant Reformation. Remember in 1517, a German monk named Martin Luther had leveled his protests against the Roman Catholic Church. But in those days, protests of that kind were not simply theological in nature, they were political in nature, because the Pope wielded armies and governed kings. When Luther said that the Church was not being faithful to the Scriptures, and thus had erred, he was threatening not only the Church's theological authority, but its strength of governance over the continent of Europe. The conflicts that emerged outwards from Luther's protest would decentralize authority in Europe. No longer could a holy Roman emperor demand that kings be subservient to him, because now kings were going to be divided over religious alliances and consequently over political authority. A string of warfares and peace treaties followed the Reformation. In 1522 was the Knights' Revolt, in which there was an attempt to overthrow the Holy Roman Emperor and his authority in Germany, led by some Protestant noblemen. This fed into the Peasants' Rebellion of 1524, one of the worst cases of bloodshed in European history, leaving 100,000 to 300,000 dead peasants. 
In 1555, the Peace of Augsburg established that each German prince could choose Catholicism or Lutheranism. It didn't open the window as wide as Calvinism, but it at least acknowledged the fact that there was now going to be a division in religious authority in the European landscape. In 1598, the Edict of Nantes gave Calvinist Protestants in France, known as Huguenots, substantial freedom to exist in a Catholic state. The boundaries of tolerance were being tested. In 1644, Roger Williams, founder of Rhode Island and Protestant theologian, wrote a 500-page book calling for a wall of separation between church and state and complete religious freedom within the colonies and more broadly. In 1651, Thomas Hobbes would publish Leviathan, a philosophical work that said, among other things, that the state can enforce outward performance of religion, though it cannot enforce a belief system. In 1685, four years before Locke's letter on toleration, King Louis XIV of France would revoke the Edict of Nantes. Religious freedom was the hot-button issue of Locke's day. He would actually put aside his Letter Concerning Human Understanding, which would be his major contribution to philosophy, published a year after the Letter Concerning Tolerance. He would put it aside to focus on the Letter of Tolerance at the request of a friend, because, in fact, this was the issue that had divided Europe for more than a century. Now, those are the political influences that would have contributed to Locke's writing, some of the warfare that emerged in his day that would have contributed to some of his passions and fears concerning religious tolerance. But there's a broad spectrum of philosophy that fed into Locke's writings. It goes back as far as Thomas Aquinas, who, remember, lived between 1225 and 1274. And Aquinas imported Aristotelian philosophy into Christian theology challenging the platonic hold that had been over Christianity since Augustine. And using the philosophical tools of Aristotle, Aquinas said that reason can cooperate with faith to establish essential truths, including things like belief in the existence of God. Reason alone can do this without scriptures or church. Thus, reason should be seen as a source of truth that cooperates with and complements faith. Aquinas' introduction of and exploration of the power of reason within theology would dominate the works of the Enlightenment philosophers. They all depended on Aquinas. They all stood on his shoulders. Another significant philosophical influence in the life of John Locke was Francis Bacon, who lived from 1561 to 1626. He's known as the father of empiricism, and his magnum opus was Novum Organum, and it was published in 1620. The title is a reference to the works of Aristotle, and it focused on artificial experiments and observations that led to the pursuit of truth. Aristotle believed in cataloging the flora and fauna of the natural world, studying how the material world worked, and believed that all truth came from the physical world around us. Bacon developed an early version of the scientific method. It's not really what scientists do today, but it was a, a focus on experimentation, observation, and induction to gain truth about the world. So that's in 1620. Remember, Locke was born in 1632, so this would have been fresh academic work just as Locke came on the scene. Of course, one of Locke's contemporaries and someone with whom Locke disagreed passionately was René Descartes. French philosopher lived from 1596 to 1650 and his great meditations on first philosophy were published in 1641. In it, he asserts that the only things that can be known about the world are known from reason alone. He begins by saying that everything can be doubted except doubting itself. When one is finished doubting everything, doubt remains. Therefore, Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. Reason is the grounding of all human thought. As a consequence, if any truth is to be known, it begins with reason. From there, Descartes would establish an argument for the existence of God and suggest that God's existence then validates empirical knowledge of the world around us. We can trust our senses because God wouldn't fool us. Now, very few people would defend Descartes' arguments today, his theological arguments, his theological apologetics, but nonetheless, it was formative in the works of the Enlightenment philosophers like Locke. Locke would disagree passionately with Descartes about the source of knowledge. In 1690, 
At the age of 58, Locke would publish his great essay concerning human understanding, and it is explicitly anti-Cartesian, saying at one point that the, the human senses, the five senses, are, quote, scarce acute enough to look into the essence of things. That's in 1325. Locke would say that the human mind upon its birth is a tabula rasa, a blank slate, and human experience, the experiences that we get through our senses, writes everything that goes upon that slate. Reason alone produces nothing. It simply organizes the data given to it through the senses. Now, I don't want to go further into Locke's epistemology in this particular discussion, but I do want to note that Locke's epistemology rested on theology. Cartesian philosophy had to defer to God. God was a present and relevant subject in the writings of the philosophers of the day. John Locke himself was a Christian who often cites the scriptures as a source of authority and will do the same in his letter concerning toleration. All of this harkens back to the works of Thomas Aquinas, one who fashioned himself primarily a theologian, writing philosophical works only in so much as they serve the cause of theology. So the bedrock of Enlightenment thinking is not a breaking away from theology, but building on the explorations of reason that theologians had already begun centuries before. Let's get to the letter concerning toleration, published in 1689, when Locke was 57. It was first published in Latin, as were all academic texts of the time. Latin was the academic language. It was actually a revolution just a century before when Luther translated the Latin scriptures into German, uh, provoking the church further, the church that was already mad at him. But because translations into the vernacular languages was becoming common, within one year, the letter concerning toleration was translated into English. It's a religious letter. It begins by saying tolerance should be the mark of the church, which he gets from the Bible. He says it is required for salvation because it is the way of Jesus. The bibliography of the letter is solely a list of Bible passages that Locke cites. Now, the main argument of the letter is to separate the role and functions of the commonwealth from the role and functions of the church. This isn't actually a separation of church and state in the way modern angry polemicists discuss. This is a categorization. It actually is a little bit reminiscent of the writings of Aquinas, who like to put things in their appropriate categories and say that certain categories function in certain ways and other categories function in different ways and they shouldn't be confused. The main argument is that the commonwealth governs the behavior of people by stopping them from infringing upon one another's rights. And to call to this task, it can use force, like punishment, to stop people from violating others' rights. The church is a free, voluntaristic society. It functions to allow people to pursue salvation. And it cannot use force because beliefs cannot be coerced. They are two fundamentally different categories that function by different principles. And so the state can never enforce religious views, which are properly subsumed within the category of the church. He begins by defining the commonwealth, like territories controlled by monarchs. And he says it's a society of men gathered to procure, promote, and preserve civil interests like life, liberty, health, and the possessions of outward things like property. Many have noted that Thomas Jefferson cites almost directly from John Locke's writings in the Declaration of Independence when he says, human beings are guaranteed certain inalienable rights, like the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. Uh, Locke would have said life, liberty, and property, but all the same, it's an allusion to Locke's works. He establishes that the magistrate is to enforce laws that prevent citizens from infringing on the rights of others. Force, which Locke often refers to as fire and sword, involves taking away civil rights of the offender, as through fining them or imprisoning them or even torturing them. He says the magistrate's, quote, power consists only in outward force, but true and saving religion consists in the inward persuasion of the mind, without which nothing can be acceptable to God. And such is the nature of the understanding that it cannot be compelled to the belief of anything by outward force. So in other words, when it comes to religious doctrine, force doesn't work. 
If you force someone to agree with your beliefs, they haven't come about their conviction through a true turn of the heart, and thus God is not pleased with their forced convictions. Religion must be allowed to be chosen. Freedom is inherent in the nature of religion. Thus the realm of the commonwealth and the realm of the church are separate. He defines a church as a voluntary society of people gathered to obtain eternal life and to do things like public worship. The church can make its own laws, Locke says, in certain categories. It can prescribe what clothes it expects people to wear to worship. It can name the time and the place of the meeting of worship. It can choose what language in which the services are practiced. But it's limited against anything illegal. That which would be illegal outside and around the church is illegal in the church. The church does have certain powers to motivate people. It can correct by, quote, exhortations, admonitions, and advice. But it does not have the power of force like the Commonwealth does. He even says the American colonies should have the right to practice their own religion free from force. Tolerance, then, comes about because religion, by its nature, requires free commitment. And the church, following the way of Jesus, never forces anyone. Likewise, the magistrate has no say in the governance of religious doctrine because the magistrate's proper sphere of authority is behavior, the behavior of people in the exercise of their civil rights. Now, there are some contradictions inherent in the thinking of Locke here. He does not extend tolerance to certain practical opinions, things that would undermine the commonwealth. The church is not allowed to teach things that would undermine the king. Now, this seems to be opposed to someone answering to a different sovereign within the walls of the church, which many have taken to imply the pope. Locke still seems to be at odds with the Catholic church, he being a Protestant and properly under the authority of the Church of England. The idea that one within the walls of the Catholic Church answers to a sovereign who lives in Rome, the Pope, is a threat to the sovereignty of the King of the Commonwealth in which the Church exists. Thus Locke seems to want to put some limits on tolerance as regards the Catholics. Likewise, he rejects tolerance of atheism. He says this is because an atheist cannot swear to God, so they can't be trusted. They can't make promises, and all society relies on mutual promises. Locke's work prompted some heated responses, which then led to an ongoing debate between Locke and some other philosophers. The letter concerning tolerance is a brilliant glimpse, a brilliant window into the discussions and debates being had in Locke's day. It's not completely original. Certainly, Roger Williams' book that's ten times as long, that prescribes a wall of separation between church and state, published in 1644, fed into Locke's thinking about this. But Locke's work is particularly articulate, and he stood in a place of authority such that it allowed him to speak into the world of philosophy and European governance in a way that would shape the formation of those societies. Because his works were so valued by colonists like Thomas Jefferson, his writings on religious tolerance would shape the way the American colonies thought about religion, and consequently, the way the Bill of Rights would be written including the First Amendment, which includes the freedom of religion. Locke's work certainly couldn't answer the questions concerning the separation of church and state today, or the many legal cases that arise in which religious people point to state interference, or in which the state has to pass laws that in one way or another are going to offend religious people. But it's a seminal work that shaped the history of all thinking about religious freedom forever after. Again, if you haven't read the letter, read it yourself. It's a brilliant read. It's beautifully written. It's such an important document in history, and it might just shape the way that you think about religious tolerance yourself. God bless your studies.